All right. So thank you guys for coming to this reading for Anne Lee Parrish and Terry Tierney. You guys know at least one of them. So we're going to get started by having Anne read. In case you don't know anything about her, Anne is an author of how many books now, Anne? Ten? Uh, we Ten, yes. Th this is book number ten. This is book number 10. So she's written a handful of novels, short story collections, and upcoming poetry collections. She's going to read from both. And then when she's done, she's going to go ahead and pass it to Terry. And take it away. I shall take it away. OK, as I say, um, I'm going to read a small selection of poems from my forthcoming collection, The Moon Won't Be Dared. It is my first uh, collection of poetry, and it comes out on the 14th of October from Unsolicited Press. Uh, I'm very proud and I'm very grateful to them for their support in this. All right, the first poem is called Pulled Back Around. Circle or line, round or straight. What did Einstein say? The universe bends in on itself or relates only to itself, I don't know but even a lizard remembers and is pulled back around. And the memory held in my larger, more deeply folded brain cries to visit its hinterland, its former place, as easily as the world circles from one day to the next. The Plains as Seen from Above. How came the river to curve like this? Back, forth, back again. All those loops, the slow side to side of a woman's hips. Nothing but hollow banks now, the memory of an earlier dance before the planet warmed or cooled or met some fiery moment on its glide through space that altered things just enough to run the river dry. <laughs> I'm just laughing because this next one, her curse. The eyes she lost rolled up on the beach. She knew it from its wink. And the blue iris flecked with black was so sweetly familiar. From hours she spent staring in the mirror, hungry to know how another would see her, which is why the eye left in the first place, though it didn't say so at the time and wouldn't say so now. The remaining eye wept with joy at the return of its mate. The missing eye didn't. It longed too much for the sea, all those eddies and currents, creatures that glowed, plants that swirled, the chiseled elegance of a coral reef. Back on dry land, it closed against the shock of sunlight and refused to open until darkness fell, turning her into a child of the night who lived on moonlight and cold sparkle of stars, shadowed and murky, pale, wasted, invisible and alone, cursed by the whim of her wandering eye. Now the title poem, The Moon Won't Be Dared. The monster has a name, the monster has a face, striding over the tender fields of my soul. You keep the monster in your heart, you cannot set him free. He runs your mind holds your body in the mirror. When is he you? When are you he? I don't believe in monsters, but here you are. Maybe I'm your monster too. Maybe we're joined at the hip, heart, umbilicus. We are one monster twirling before the sky, laughing at stars, daring the moon to cut us apart. The moon won't be dared. She's too beautiful in her silver glow. How we love her joyous remove up there alone. Graced by the universe to wax and wane. While we never come or go, only cling madly to each other. The river. Ride, then name the river that runs through your life. Carry no grief for the passing years. Time does its job, as do you. No day like another, no breath like those before. Everything glides out of sight, remembered, foreseen. 
impossible to hold longer than a heartbeat. That river's had some wicked turns, not to mention the rapids and rocks. Keep riding it, no matter what. And when it slows a bit and lets you drift, calm in its quiet lilt, rejoice in this moment, this flash, this now. Time. Let's call it a study in detachment, gradual drift from passion to prayer. Then even that loses strength. We grow quiet, soft and slow, joyous in the face of this timely withdrawal. We've given so much, we're ready now to hold a little back from this riot of shifting light we know as life. And the last poem is the last one in the book, a survey of the female experience. The rib never fit and the apple had worms. Fig leaves are for fools shaming the triangle of life. Caves sheltered as long as you brought down your share. Felled by points you chiseled, chiseled by the hour in between sewing skins and putting the baby to your breast. Migrations, snow, death, seeds sown, crops harvested. You learn to read, get the vote, work on the floor with a glass ceiling, are told you are unreliable, emotional, a false accuser when your boss grabs your ass. You want to go on the pill and your doctor looks at your ringless left hand then says no. You get an abortion to free yourself of a burden you cannot carry given you by a man who lied, stole, cheated. You live in a country where the ruling party wants to own your womb. It's their right, they say, because they know so much better. You will never go back, accept cruelty as fate, apologize for the drive of your sex, close your eyes to their blindness. And that's all I have for my poems. I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to switch now to prose as befits the topic of our reading, poetry and prose. And I'm gonna read uh, from my most recent novel, A Winter Night, that published just last March, also from Unsolicited Press. Um, this is a novel, it's a man and woman novel, so much of my stuff is. Um, the two characters, Angie and Matt, are trying to decide if they're going to be a going concern, be a couple or not. And at the moment, things are not going very well. So I'm gonna read that. Then they're yelling. He says she can't tell other people what to do. She says he's been played for a fool. At that, his hand comes down hard on the bar. He says if he's been a fool about anyone, it's her. There are more words, but Angie loses track. Something pent up inside of both of them runs wild. Neither of them can catch it. She grabs her coat and is out the door. He doesn't come after her. She walks to her car without putting her coat on, not feeling the cold, not caring if she freezes to death there on the sidewalk. In her car with the engine on, staring through the thin layer of ice that formed in her absence, she sits feeling the rage slip away. In its place is a hole that bewilderment and regret quickly fill. She takes out her phone. There's a message from Lynn, another from Potter. She can't listen to them now. She can go back to the bar, but what would she say? She cries, hoping Matt will appear, but he has no idea where she parked. She stops crying and wipes her face. She waits until she can't wait any longer. She drives home, collapses on the couch, and weeps herself dry. After a period of time that could have been minutes or an hour, perhaps even longer, she opens a can of soup and thinks back to the burger she barely touched. The soup is lukewarm and salty. She realizes it's split pea with ham, never her favorite. Why did she buy it then? Had she been trying to persuade herself that it was a wise choice? How can something you can't stand ever be a wise choice? She forces herself to eat what's in the bowl, puts it in the sink, rinses out the pan and stretches out on the couch. Her face is hot and her hands are cold. So are her feet. She grabs the soft throw. She keeps neatly folded on the back of the couch and tosses it over her legs. She lies on her side, facing into the room and focuses on her breathing. 
When she wakes up, it's well after midnight. Peggy, this is her cat, is curled up behind her knees. Angie feels a surge of affection for her constant presence, loyalty, unconditional love, all things she hoped to receive from Matt and now never will. She sits up. Maybe she shouldn't have ordered Sharon from the bar. She probably wouldn't have stayed too much longer in any case. Matt's right. It wasn't up to her to bully her like that. But after all this time, with her hanging around in the periphery, Angie snapped. And then the old mean girl came out in full force. She looks at her phone. No new calls, no texts. She taps in his number and stops. She undresses and slides into bed. Tomorrow, everything will sort itself out. Only it doesn't. Angie pours herself into work, which means making sure the Christmas spirit pervades everything until even the most withdrawn re residents enjoy the piped in carols. The staff all wear Christmas tree pins. The nurse in Lorna Green's memory care hall even pins one on her. Lorna doesn't know the difference and Angie doesn't have the heart to remind the nurse that Lorna is Jewish. She doesn't have the heart for anything. Her limbs are heavy and slow. In the ladies' room after lunch, she decides she hates her hair, though it's as thick and shiny as ever. She schedules an appointment for after work. Her stylist hasn't seen her for a while and asks what she's got in mind. Angie says she wants bangs and a bob. The stylist says ever since Michelle Obama got hers, bangs have been really in. She takes her to the wash bowl, leans her, leans her back, and drenches her head with water that's almost too hot. Angie says nothing and figures this discomfort will buy her some small forgiveness either for her recent transgression or one in the future, of which there will no doubt be many. The stylist natters about her annual Christmas trauma. Her husband's parents live in Vermont, which sounds like a lovely place to spend the holidays, right? Only their house is ancient, the windows leak air, the appliances in the kitchen are about 50 years old, and making dinner is a super challenge. Her husband loves the place, thinks it's rustic and quaint, but then he's never in the kitchen. He's not the one boiling potatoes on a gas stove that has trouble staying lit or roasting a bird in an oven whose thermometer has no bearing on reality. She's not kidding. One year, she brought up one of those thermometers you hang on one of the racks and she noted a difference of over 30 degrees. She left it there safe in a drawer, but the next year she couldn't find it anyway. Her mother-in-law has mobility problems and her sister-in-law, the husband's brother's wife, doesn't do anything but sit on her butt and scream at her kids who hide in the grandparents' bedroom with the TV on all the time. So who ends up in the kitchen? That's right, yours truly. Her scissors snip, Angie's hair collects on the floor. She regards herself in the mirror. Her smock has a pattern of pink flowers that remind her of the gowns you put on at the doctor's office. As her hair shortens and lies more closely around her face, she despairs for choice. She recalls being six years old and her father, in an attempt to do something useful, lined all the kids up and cut their hair. It was a nice idea, except he was three sheets to the wind. Only Angie's came out reasonably well. Everyone else had dramatically uneven hairlines. Their mother berated him for days. As the stylist puts on the finishing touches, Angie's new bangs give her an innocent, even hopeful air, as if she could wish upon a star and have everything work out just right. She watches her eyes moisten, the stylist doesn't notice. She's busy running product through her hair, pinching and plumping. The mousse smells too sweet, like a flower about to rot. The smilist removes the smock, hands her a mirror and turns her chair around so she can appreciate the back. Matt would say how different she looks. He might say he didn't recognize her at first. Then he'd say he doesn't like the new cut, that she was fine before. That's not the kind of thing Matt would say, or is it? Since the blow up, she feels she doesn't know him never really knew him. He's probably thinking the same thing about me. So that's it then. They met as strangers and parted the same way. And I will leave it there if you've had enough and pass it to Terry. Thank you for listening. Are you ready, Terry, dear, to read for us? Oh, I don't hear you. Yeah, as soon as I'm muted, I'm <laughs> I think you, I think you were muted there for a moment. I was. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, th thank you, Anne, and, and I want to oh, thank, thank you for listening. That was that was great. I, I really enjoyed that a lot, and um, I also enjoyed your book. And congratulations on your on your poetry book. Thank you. I, and I want to thank uh, Unsolicited Press and Summer for uh, you know, hosting this reading, and also um, for publishing. Uh, the Poets Garage and, and Lucky Ride. Um, and I want to thank Anne again. Um, I'm a big fan of hers, and it's really an honor to, to be reading uh, with, with Anne.
Uh, the first poem I'm going to uh, read is uh, is a poem that I read at my sister's wedding. And, um, and then I was doubly honored when her daughter asked me to read it at her wedding. How to build a house. First, wait until the snow clears. Pull on rubber boots with wide soles so you will not damage the carpet. Walk until you find a depression where deer have rested in tall grass. Here you will sleep. Walk out of the bedroom and turn in a circle until your eyes water facing the wind. Here you will place your chair. The roof is self-explanatory, but walls are something you will raise yourself. Be sure to plan your windows. Now call your friends and gather sticks for a fire. If it snows before daybreak, you will have to begin again. Uh, this, this next poem is also uh, inside, a, inside a house. Um, I'm kind of fascinated by how we arrange rooms around us that kind of match our inner selves. Um, and this one uh, occurs in a kitchen. It's called the empty bottle. Clenching its neck, you swing against the table's steel edge. Stars burst around us, shards of glass, blood-tinted wine on skin. Unable to move, our clothes discarded for ritual, the polished kitchen littered now with edges. We stare at the glass, ourselves. We stare well into night, air cold, stiff as wax. I watch your hair turn gray, canyons form on your face, your flesh cooling under skin. I, in a concave mirror, I see my own body tighten with endless years. If I could move now, I would reach for the door. Neither of us move. We never break our pose, never leave that room. I'd like to read the um, title poem for the Poets Garage. And I wanna show you the cover quickly here. Um, the cover is actually an illustration of this poem. And um, it's based on a true story. Uh, when we moved to Lincoln, Nebraska, we soon learned that there was another Terry Tierney living in Lincoln, Nebraska. <laughs> and I first found that out because I, I got a phone call from the social services department saying, Terry, why haven't you shown up for your job? How are you gonna support your wife and four kids? And, and I came to realize that uh, that was just the, just the beginning. Uh, the Poet's Garage. When the policemen come to arrest me for forgery, I hide out in the garage where I learned how to write my manual laid out on the bench, words stacked around me like old tires, pools of black grease where lines have spilled, staining the sawdust. I watch the detective study the house, his junky nose running. He anticipates my arrest and waits for my wife to come home from the library. He reads her the charge, how I forge checks in three counties. The name is right, but the description fails. The forger stands taller, pounds heavier, a different Smith. My husband looks like a mechanic, she says, and he's much older. I grin my toothless grin, holding a bucket of greasy words. A blue suited sergeant refuses to believe her, saying I am both smaller and larger, older and younger, a mechanic and a Smith. Look in the garage, she says, modifiers hanging on nails, the cardboard box of active verbs, files of proper nouns. No signatures remain, the author gone, only the spaces where he worked. They gather the spaces for evidence. I escape with the narrative, some of it leaking on the way until my book breaks down in Pennsylvania. When my wife escapes and brings my tools, I begin to forge a new silence, a new name, a new library. So I'd like to read a more recent poem that's uh, not in this collection. And uh, so we all know that, um, you know, Hemingway had polydactyl cats, <laughs> you know, with, uh, you know, extra toes. And um, uh, when, I, when I lived in uh, New York State, um, my sister had polydactyl cats, you know, her and her, uh, 
her daughters. And um, of course, you know, I wondered if they were related to Hemingway's cats. And so I imagined uh, one of Hemingway's cats migrating up north, you know, to bring me some inspiration. It's called, it starts with Hemingway. Hunched over black typewriter, that famous photograph, musing light, sun-washed curtains, cigarette targeting keys, another burning in glass ashtray, sleeveless, fly sticking sweat. He slams the carriage return, rifle bolt spitting empty shells, platen injecting a new line, polydactyl cat on the windowsill. The same cat perches in my chair, matted fur from trekking north, Key West to Miami by boat, padding through snaky swamps, canvas vest stuffed with flasks, sultry whiskey and cognac promise, carton of camels and backpack. Typing fast with six toes, no thumb for spacebar, endless paragraph unrolling toward asphalt horizon. Word to word, strangers, no more. Kerouac, asleep in the back. My turn to drive. So uh, that, that provides a, um, talking about Hemingway provides a kind of a bridge to, uh, to my novel. So uh, this is the cover of my novel, Lucky Ride, which is coming out in December. And the narrator of, of Lucky Ride is a uh, recent Vietnam era veteran, and it's 1973. And I'm gonna, the first section I'm gonna read is uh, the beginning of the novel. Uh, and so I'll just jump right in. No sooner did I decide to hitchhike to California than I got a surprise call from Rick Gardner, one of my buddies from the Navy. He had just delivered a load of Mexican marijuana to Boston and he would swing through Binghamton in a few days. Did he want company on his drive back to Fort Worth? You bet. Hanging up the phone, I was already gone off on my first lucky ride, a thousand miles up interstate for my wife Ronnie's affair with her boss. Rick pulled up in front of our apartment, the top floor of a rundown triplex on a Wednesday evening. The family of Jesus freaks who lived below us was already asleep, but I saw Grandma Roller peeking through her bedroom curtains when I went to help him unload. There wasn't much to witness that night, just Rick in his blue jeans, unbuttoned white shirt, three empty Coke cans in one hand, and his wild blonde hair flopping over his John Lennon glasses and scruffy beard. He leaned over the trunk and dragged out his Navy issue duffel bag stuffed with marijuana and dirty laundry. The hood of his old 64 Ford steamed under the street lamp. Its red paint flaked off from the heat, revealing gray primer underneath as if it had been driven through licks of fire. I listened to faint cracks of metal in escaping air as the huge machine began to cool. With hot forged steel, thick joints and beams, the car was built to drive all night long. Rick could tell I was ready to leave right then, but he wanted a bed and a smoke. We were quiet not to wake the neighbors, but we shook hands and hugged like brothers, spilling his Coke cans on the soggy lawn. One of the things that always impressed me about Rick was how he could chug a Coke with one gulp and ask for another his one bigger than life Texas habit. Hey Flash, good to see you out of the suck, he said. My friends called me Flash because of my uncanny good luck and because I was often slow to make decisions. I like to check all the angles as if my life were plotted on one vast astronomy chart. Rick glanced up at the porch. Ronnie's working late, but she'll be home soon, I said. Rick and I retreated to the rusty kitchen table, eating ginger snap cookies and drinking a pot of deep black coffee brewed in the electric percolator, our only luxury, and purchased at a discount from my dad's company store. I retrieved a jar of tang from the cupboard. Remember all that tang we drank when we were stoned, Rick asked, helping himself and recalling the time we were stationed together in ADAC in the remote Aleutian Islands? The official beverage of astronauts, I replied, I stirred a heaping spoonful into a jelly glass and downed it, smacking my lips. When Rick headed for the shower, I took the dog outside. I liked Bobo better when he was a puppy before Ronnie countermanded all my attempts to train him. She claimed he was a free spirit with all the inherent rights of existence and it was not our place to discipline him. He should answer to his own being, 
not what we wanted him to be. He was his own dog. And ever true to his sense of purpose, he raced for the neighbor's garbage can as soon as I let him loose. Bobo gathered his momentum and launched himself like a canine evil Knievel, a small white and black stunt dog, hurling himself over the rim, expertly catching the edge and tipping the can. Before I caught him, he had torn a hole in the plastic garbage bag and pulled out a chicken carcass that smelled worse than anything I could imagine. He growled and shook it back and forth. I managed to grab his collar and drag him back to the clothesline while I collected the remains of his feast. I stood up from the pail of garbage and scanned the overcast sky behind the, beyond the streetlights, trying to catch a fresh breeze to chase the putrid odor of rotting potatoes, sour coffee grounds, and blackened hamburger packages. Spring was oozing down the hillside, and the wind smelled of dead leaves and wet mud, a mildewed smell. Under the thickest stands of spruce, dirt was still frozen in an icy crust, though it was the first week of May. The sky never brightened, but it seldom rained, just a dreary intermittent mist changing to snow if the temperature dropped. Only a few buds had cracked on the trees, and the pale gray branches merged into the gray canopy of sky. I wondered if the trees and flowers would ever bloom. For our converted triplex, ugly in any season, it was the worst time of year. Without the seasonal blankets of snow or leaves, the old house revealed its poor upkeep. A large farmhouse successively remodeled by generations of handymen, it sprawled up and back from the street like an abandoned shells of a colony of mussels. Green shingles of varying shades from moss to canned spinach covered the roof. Looking over the old farmhouse apartments in the gray sky made me want to leave more and head south where we're sure to be warmer and brighter and then west to the sparkling Pacific. Uh, so Flash sets off <laughs> on his uh, hitchhiking trip and uh, along the way he, he visits uh, a number of his friends uh, from the service in ADAC. Um, and in this, uh, this uh, short scene I'm going to read, he just picked up a ride outside of Los, uh, Los Angeles and shared a, shared a joint with the driver. After we finished the joint, she inserted an Allman Brothers tape live at the Fillmore East and turned it up. Maybe it was the Almonds or my vector to Las Vegas where I planned to see Phil Brionis, but my mind drifted back to, our first, to my first night on ADAC when I met Phil and offered to share my stash of Joe's pillowcase red. That night, we bounced down a series of gravel roads extending far from the base lights and any signs of humanity. Phil had organized a car party with Billy Sullivan and Jerry Fenn in the old black Buick I was destined to buy from him a few months later. On the dash balance, two small bookshelf speakers wired to a portable cassette deck, blurring Elizabeth Reed. As the honored guest, I rode shotgun next to Phil. My job is to keep the speakers from falling, which was not that easy. Blasted by rain and wind, the car rocked on its class springs and scraped bottom as we drove through deep holes and pools on the abandoned road. Lightning burst through the thick clouds and revealed a mountainous landscape devoid of trees with rivulets of water flowing down and across the road as if we were cruising up a stream bed. My new comrades laughed and said not to worry. Phil produced a bong, not wanting to waste my precious weed by rolling joints, and Billy handed around a bottle of Sweet Taylor Pink Catawba wine. Wasted and not at all comforted by their claims about the safety of the road and the sturdiness of the Buick, I thought I might die. We don't call her the Dreadnought for nothing, Phil said, patting the cracked dashboard. We swung down an even narrower path and Jerry yelled up to Phil, you can't cross here, it might be washed out. It's cool, Phil yelled back. We were up here in the Jeep last week and the road was fine. No problem. But the tide's high and it's storming, Jerry persisted. And this ain't no Jeep, it's the fucking Buick. Hey, Phil, crooned Billy. Jerry says it's raining. But Phil would not be diverted from his planned route. We have to show Flash what ADAC is really like. The road narrowed to one car, which was one car width with an ocean of water on either side. A wave crashed off and over the car, inspiring Jerry and Billy to hoot with pleasure. I clasped the wine bottle like a crucifix when a second wave crashed up from the other side and doused the car again. 
Ways washed us from both sides in a sickening rhythm as the old Buick continued to inch along. Finally, I burst, where are we? I felt like the Pharaoh crossing the dry bed of the Red Sea with the walls of water crashing down. Phil turned to me. His voice echoed the calm rhythmic drone of a tour director. To our right is Lake Andrew, really a large lagoon. And to the left is the Bering Sea. Lake Andrew is fresh water. Not for long, Jerry chortled. Looks like the sea wants to take it back. After one high wave teetered above us and collapsed like an office building, Billy yelled, punch the damn pedal. I ain't drowning tonight. Phil pushed the speed up to about 10 miles per hour, which was all he dared, given the dreadnought suspension and the condition of the road, if it was a road. We finally turned off the estuary and climbed to drier ground over gravel with rocks the size of watermelons, where we stopped to finish the wine and quiet our nerves before returning to the base. My initiation complete. Less than a day after I got off a flight from LA and I knew what ADAC was like, a washed out road with waves crashing from either side. Every time I thought about Phil, I remembered how we parted the sea in the dreadnought that first night we met, our friendship sealed by the Bering Sea. <laughs> I'd like to uh, read one last poem and uh, return to uh, the poet's garage. If I can. <laughs> But uh, I seem to have misplaced my book. So I'm going to, um, I guess I'm just going to end it now. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> oh my goodness. Thank you, Terry. That was great. It was so good. Somebody came in and swiped it on you. <clears throat> well, I found it, but it's probably too late. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so we were going to do a little uh, Q and A if um, if people are interested in that. So if if anybody has any questions you'd like to ask either of us, uh, please do. Um, otherwise, um, I'll uh, start pelting uh, questions at uh, at Anne. Uh oh, I better duck. <laughs> I I should probably know this um, being in your group, Terry, but. Uh, and I've heard you read the whole Lucky Ride. I already know I love it. Um, when can we give reviews? I could do that now, right? Or have I? I'm sorry, that sounds so uh, uncouth. I don't even know if I gave you. I, have, um, I showed you a review copy. I do have some review copies. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, if you want it, it's not actually going to be released until December, but if you'd like to write a review, um, you know, let me know. I can send you a copy. Okay. I, can, I can send you a PDF or, or a review copy. Sure. Okay. Uh, any other any other questions? Uh, hey, Terry, hey, Terry, I've got a question for you. So like, as far, I, mean, I know you write, you know, I mean, you, you obviously write fiction and fiction and poetry. And I was just wondering, you know, because I feel like they both sort of inform each other. So I was just wondering, I guess I have a couple of questions. One is which form do you prefer writing in? And also how do you feel like they intersect, if you know what I mean? Or how do you feel like they, you know, inform each other or, um, do you feel like there is a relationship there between your uh, poetry and your novel writing? Yeah, um, I think there is. Um, well, when I, when I start writing something, I'm not sure usually if it's going to be a poem or a story. Um, and I think, I think you know, um, Anne might, might answer this a little bit differently. You know, for me, um, you know, poems tend to be kind of uh, condensed uh, stories and, and they tend to like link image to image. Whereas a story might have more of a, a plot, you know, a character moving through their, you know, their life or, um, you know, through a situation. So that, that, although, you know, you can have that in a poem too, but for me, it's, it, I guess it's, it, you know, it feels, um, you know, like I say, with, with a poem, with a poem, it's, it, it tends on, it depends on kind of the images that I'm coming up with and how, you know, how many I can link together and, and stuff and whether or not I'm starting to feel that there's a, uh, you know, you know. Sometimes when you rub two images together, you get a little bit of a spark, and that's um, that's what I look for in a poem. Um, with a uh, with fiction, though, I think it's you know it is a little bit of a, a you know broader canvas, but um, 
Uh, one of the things I was I was uh, going to ask uh, Anne about, and you, you know, she can um, she can respond to this too, is that I think in terms of editing, you know, I, I give them both equal weight. You know, meaning that I spend as much time on a paragraph of my fiction as I do on a poem. You know, trying to you know edit it and get it you know get it right, and um, and so you know the, it's linked together that way. And of course, you know, I'm talking about a lot of the same things that that concern me between the two. Um, does that kind of answer your question, um, Stuart? Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you. That's interesting. Thanks. Um, Anne, how would you how would you respond to that? OK, so, uh, so just to, to refresh, you're asking basically you know, how we go about poetry versus prose and, 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 and holding them together in the same body and the same mind. I think that's that's kind of uh, you know, what you were asking. Um, you know, I a little bit of history. I wrote prose for decades, short fiction really only, and I didn't get into novels uh, for a long, long time um, because I, I wanted more room to roam. That's how I made that jump from stories to to novels. I was always people would tell me you're a very visual writer. You're very into imagery. And after all this time expanding and expanding, suddenly I wanted to get very concentrated and very focused and very lyrical. And hence, that's how poetry came to be, uh, you know, for me. Um, I find poetry very free. Um, I don't have to nail down the world in a poem the way I have to nail it down in a short story or a novel. We, we live in the world and stories and novels represent that world that we know. Yes, dreamlike aspects of it, that's wonderful, but I'm much more disciplined with keeping about intent on keeping my feet on the ground in prose as it were. Poetry, I am free, I can do whatever I want as long as there is movement in a poem and the reader is taken from one place to another or can see a way forward. Um, that's to me very, very important that there be some kind of movement. And when, when the ending is reached, that person knows why they've read that poem and why it means something to them. Um, but I, I'm just having such a ball with poetry. I can't even tell you, it's a blast. It's a blast. Thank you for the responses. Thank you. Thank you. Sure.